to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Ah, welcome in. I'm laughing at it's Monday time. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome in one and all, Monday, August 21st, the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Mike Wright, Jason Moore, I'm Andy Holloway, and we're back with a breakouts episode of the show. Another weekend of preseason football in the books. We got news to talk about. We've got regular size news. We got itty bitty news. Mm hmm. And we've got some uh, optimism around some players returning to camp today that we'll talk about as well. However, we do have a big time <laughs> announcement. The Megala Ball <laughs> is open. It is ready to be signed up for. What is the Megala Bowl, you what ask? Is, what is the Megala Bowl, Jason? Well, it is the biggest, best fantasy football league slash tournament slash contest slash thesauruses that has ever existed. Uh, it is, to our knowledge, the largest regular managed uh, season-long fantasy football league. And the winner of the Megala Bowl gets into our listener league next year. So you can join you're in a 12 team league with ballers preferred scoring settings you're in there with other foot clan members it is an awesome time you you left out the eternal glory part of you winning also, the Megaball? if you win you do get eternal glory that's true i mean i feel like the eternal glory comes from then playing in the listener league with us like that's really the i don't think so. you don't think so you think no, it's more I, th I mean i think the... it's 20,000 more than 20,000 played last year i don't know what, what the total the total was might have been like 22 23 but uh, thousands of of foot clan supporters players in the league megalobowl.com mm -hmm. megalobowl.com for the, all the rules all the all the stuff you need to know where you sign up how you sign up make sure you sign into your existing sleeper account if you already have one uh when you're signing up the drafts will be on September 3rd 4th 5th and 6th and uh, will be a very good time. I will be in the Megalobowl as well. I, I always am, so uh, pick your draft slot wisely. I've already signed up. Maybe maybe I'll be in your league. Yeah, it's going to be it's gonna be awesome. A lot of you have been asking, is the Megalobowl coming back? We were just biding our time before we made the big announcement. Do I get, like, when I win, do I get two teams? That's I think that's deserved. Yeah, I think yeah we, we were about 22,000 last year. I think we way. go to a 13-team league. And oh, you, I just kick someone out. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And you get an extra. Um, very exciting. Megalobull.com. If you support the show over on Join the Foot, you get an entry. Uh, so it's time. Go ahead and pick your draft spot. We we have a whole bunch of them. That way you can pick one that works with your schedule. More improvements to the Megalobull this year. We try to refine that every year. We know that, you know, we get all of your feedback every mm -hmm. season. We try to make it better. And um, it's going to be awesome. Will be a lot of fun, and then uh, it's all things mega. We are going to be uh, having a Megala show out yes. in LA on Saturday. BallersLive.com for tickets there, and the Ultimate Draft Kit available right now at UltimateDraftKit.com. News and notes from around the league, presented by USAA Insurance. We do have one more preseason game for Week Two: Baltimore, Washington tonight. <laughs> Thank you. That's is that your first? That's howl? my first howl. It was. It was like I a five out of ten. I was raised never to howl until a a man's made a starter. Mm. So I wasn't willing to do it until he was declared the official starter. Is he actually playing tonight? I don't know. <laughs> it's been weird. Actually, we we've had quite a few teams that absolutely don't play starters. The Saints last night. It was you know Jameis Winston starting. Kamara and uh, Jamal Williams sat down. Um, Kendra Miller got a chance to get back out on the field, which is great. But other teams, they do play their starters. You know, you saw them for a large portion of the game. I, I received a very um, entertaining tweet directly at me saying, are we ready to give the Steelers 
their respect because they shut out the Bills. <laughs> huh? In the preseason? Yeah, in the preseason. Did Josh Stallion even play? He did. Okay. I've, <laughs> man, I need. I got a lot of catching up to do. Yeah. So, um, no. I'll give you credit in the season, though. I think that's going to be a good team. Yeah. I think it's going to be a great divisional battle from all four teams there. But, yeah, the preseason, uh, the wins and losses, they don't matter to me. Uh, we had an injury, Jason. Mm. Dolphins running back, Devon A. Chain. It was, if you didn't see the play, it was ev It was the entire. Was that the play he got hurt on? Yes, that oh. was the play he got hurt on. It was, it was uh, a shoulder injury week to week right now. Front to back, it was the entire Devon A. Chain experience mm -hmm. because you saw that he was a little smaller. Then you saw his shiftiness, his burst through the hole he was so fast rips off a huge run then eventually defense catches up with him grabs him lifts him up picks him up like a little child and slams him to the ground where he injured his shoulder and this is you know this is the problem we, we've we've talked about how for fantasy football purposes in order to get enough touches enough carries enough workload you usually have to have a certain weight otherwise you can't withstand that punishment and then you saw it on that play. You saw everything. I love Devon A. Chain. I think he's going to be electric and succeed, but his weight is a scary proposition because he can be tossed around. Week to week right now with the shoulder, so uh, avoided a severe injury. Um, we have Mostert, an injured Jeff Wilson right now. We have Salvin, Salvin Ahmed, who had a big game. We have... The gas man, Miles Gaskin, and we have Devon Aitchin. Can't believe Miles Gaskin's still there. <laughs> he's, I, to he's me, that feels up. like he's always on. He's, yeah, this is like the episode of uh, of, of Seinfeld where um, I think George has been fired, but he just keeps showing up at the office. I feel like Miles Gaskin is walking <laughs> in there and he's just like looking around, hoping he can still I get gets some, to hang around. Can I get some touches today, Coach. Yeah, I mean, he's just someone's going to eventually count uh, in season wait. and be like, they they got. They got fifty four they got fifty four <laughs> players on yeah. their roster. Uh Cooper Cup resuming practice. That's great news. George Kittle, Elijah Mitchell supposed to return to practice this week. Uh hey, the only way they can get banged up again is to get back out there. Here's big news for you, Andy. Josh Jacobs. Uh it's being widely reported he's expected to report before week one. Josh McDaniels didn't comment on the situation. We had an article in the Las Vegas Review Journal. We had uh another um comment from on the eisen show from i want to say vic to who's a beat writer out there who is reporting he's going to be back we had the general manager signing autographs saying he's going to get a deal done hopefully this is all leaning the right direction we did see zamir white have some quality touches in the preseason game yesterday uh, about four a carry scored a touchdown but the josh jacobs is is the dude so we need to see him back out there now I'm sure Andy doesn't want this, but Jason, you're we we are aligned often in sometimes wanting to see the world burn. Oh yeah, that's real. Fun. Is there 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 is a part of me that I hope Josh Jacobs just is Fat Thor and shows <laughs> just he like he yes. he walks with the contract signed in hand and he has just let himself go and he's like i'm here for my money <laughs> uh, i i love the fun of that i'm guessing he wants money next year too though yeah but he'll work his way into it <laughs> oh, gosh uh, i'm not i'm not yet in football shape give well, me a few months what do we think about the hype train surrounding kenneth gainwell right now i i i, I think it's interesting um the eagles are a mysterious team with how they use their running backs so it's we've been trying to our best to track what they're doing with the guys in preseasons uh for example week one it was rashad penny and Don, deandre swift boston scott kenneth gainwell they were the players that got to sit go to the next week gainwell is playing deandre swift is not playing i still think uh, i think that kenneth gainwell is the is the running back to target when you factor in everything of upside and ADP and downside? Because there, there certainly is a downside of taking DeAndre Swift in the sixth round. There's an upside. Maybe he ends up being the guy, and pass catching is kind of his specialty. But at where everyone is right now, and Rashad Penny got to play again this week, but he was kind of the last man up. 
So Ken- Kenneth Gainwell is a very capable player who the Eagles seem to really appreciate his skill set. I'm I'm guessing this team is going to have four running backs, and all of them will be somewhat involved. I I find myself just out here for fantasy. I mean, last year you had Miles Sanders, who was pretty much the dude. I mean, Kenneth Gainwell was a little bit involved. Boz Scott carried it a few times, but like Miles Sanders finishes the running back thirteen right. in fantasy football. You can't ask for much more than that, and you didn't like it. It wasn't a good process. You couldn't start. You know, he he wasn't consistent. Uh, he you know wasn't involved in the passing game because that's not Jalen Hurts' style. And obviously, they don't need to change that. It kind of worked for them. They got to the Super Bowl. So to me, it's like I just don't. I think there's going to be too many people involved. And even if someone finishes the season okay, it's not going to be a fun process. I mean, it may, in best ball, that's fine. If you want to go that route, but in your redraft leagues, I'm I'm not drafting anybody here. And just because we got to get Bill O'Brien back into the news here, he believes Bob. he believes Ezekiel Elliott remains capable of contributing on all three downs. Yeah. in New England, you wouldn't have signed him if you didn't believe that. Yeah. NFL teams, seem we think you cannot contribute <laughs> NFL teams. on first or third down. They seem he's to- a second down back. Ooh, is there is there yeah. ever been a second down That's back? That's what he is. Wow. <laughs> what would the skill set be specifically for an only second down back? <laughs> you're probably someone who can You're get... really good at play fakes? <laughs> yeah. 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 Your, your play action cell is absolutely incredible. I guess he's, yeah. he's more of a fourth down back. He might be a fourth down back. Mm, there, so you protect the punter? No, you just you get the one-yard gain. Ah. You get the fourth down. But he, it, to Zeke's credit, Last year, when the schedule got very favorable for him at the end of the year, he was an absolute touchdown machine. Only Kyle could drum up the best second down backs in football in under thirty seconds. Yeah, but these are players; these are just running backs. These no, I. But look, it's very fascinating to me that there are backs that are ranked better on second down. Austin Eckler, McCaffrey, Jacobs, Henry Chubb. Okay, these are all the yeah, good running backs. Saying, Wait, you mean the good running backs were also good on second down? It's who you expect. I want a running back that. Only go in on second. Yeah, the, he his contract, he says, I'm not out there on first down. That's a risky down. <laughs> second down's a little looser. Yeah, third down, also high risk because yeah. you got to get a first down or the, everyone's going to be real mad. But second down, everyone loves the second down running back. Yeah, anything can happen. You, you still got a third down after <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, you got a chance of it not being 10 yards you have to gain. Your know, first down's like you always got to gain all those yards. Second down, it can be easy. Yeah. And <laughs> if you fail, it's okay. Yeah, we got third down. Oh, man. We're a second down kind I, of show. I want to be a second down <laughs> running back. Yeah, that's not too bad. All right, that was today's news and notes presented by USAA Insurance. Learn more at usaa.com slash insurance. Uh, before we get into the breakouts, a couple quick things. Um, the Ultimate Draft Kit, we are updating it constantly. I did a huge audit this morning. Saw that. Um, which included uh, some adjustments on Khalil Herbert that apparently I hadn't made uh, until recently, adjusting kind of where I see Foreman and Roshan Johnson. And a bunch of other players this morning just kind of, uh, you know, looking at things like I noticed you adjusted Cleo Shakir, right? Because he's mm-hmm. looking like fifth in the depth chart in Buffalo. There was optimism around him. Now it's Deontay Hardy and Trent Shortfield oh, baby. who are getting opportunities. Where, Nasty boy. Hardy. Yeah, I mean, uh, here, I mean, in Buffalo, just to speak to that, like Deontay Hardy getting third wide receiver opportunities, like that has had a ton of value. Like Gabe Davis, mm-hmm. even if Gabe Davis has a good year, Gabe Davis is a, uh, what, 60 to 70 reception type of player? I mean, maybe mid-70s if you're lucky, kind of old-school Vincent Jackson volume. So, like, Isaiah McKenzie, Cole Beasley, these are players that have had value in this offense. So, uh, if you've got a slot receiver, now maybe, you know, maybe Dalton Kincaid kind of nerfs that for you, but it's worth paying attention to. He won't. But Hardy oh, like, he's looked great no, this I know, weekend. I know he has. Hardy uh, for Dynasty is a true nasty boy who should be uh, – just check if he's out there. But Hardy for Josh Allen is – this is absolutely incredible. He is an, he is a sensational deep ball uh, – uh, or deep route runner. Like he's so fast and he can win down the field. Right, which also is for Josh. Joshua Allen will. Well, as you say, and so can Gabe Davis, and so yeah. can Stephon Diggs, and and. Well, Gabe Davis kind of lumbers down there, like Hardy will actually beat the defender. Mm, that was pretty. That's kind of rude. Mm-hmm. I mean, I didn't know you felt this way about the babe. I mean, he's just he's he's there. Wow. Okay. Wow. <laughs> strong words. 
We got a bust episode this week. We got Gabe Davis no, coming no, in. No, no, we, no. we I, might have Gabe Davis on this episode, I'm, fellas. No, I, I like him for fantasy. I'm saying like, but player. You, you think he's a lumberer? I think he is. How big do you think this man is? Gabe Davis? Yeah. He's, he's a decent size. You know who looked like he was lumbering in preseason? Kyle Pitts. Oh. The, looked the, like he was doing the poop walk. <laughs> He was running around. He's full. He's clinched. He was running around, and he looked like he wasn't. Yeah, he's a little clinched. Hmm. And did you see the target he caught too? Yeah, four yards behind him. He caught it though. He did catch it. But you don't understand what the mental <laughs> toll is when you have to do that every single time. He even tried to run slower, apparently, to make it easy. Get back to the huddle. Okay, I I know I caught it. I caught, just, just don't just, do. It's a little closer next time. A little bit, maybe, maybe, no. maybe in front of like. <clears throat> where yeah. I'm running. Yeah, like if you throw it, if you lead me, I can go score a touchdown. But okay, you do wherever. Wherever you want to throw it, I'll, I'll handle it. All right, let's move on to the breakouts. Breakouts. It's a lot of guitar for one word. <sighs> yeah, but these are breakouts. That's true. You uh, got to gotta build it up. Mike, why don't you uh, kind of... Give the TLDR of how we view breakouts for sure. all the brand new listeners, which, by the way, thank you for tuning into the show. Anybody that's joining us for the first time this year, very happy to have you. So uh, to me, and I guess to us, a, a breakout player is someone who not only exceeds their ADP, but they take that jump, a tier jump. Uh, so like when you're thinking about where will they be in a draft next year? Well, it's probably multiple rounds uh, earlier than they went this year, you know, just a a ton of success from what you're expecting, but you can be, it can be wherever in the draft. So like last year in the ultimate draft kit in our breakout section, guys, we had highlighted Jalen hurts and CD lamb. CD lamb was still an early round draft pick, but he paid off in a big way. Cause he, he himself took a big jump uh, as a player, as a focal point in the offense. And Jalen hurts, of course, yeah, just cannot be stopped. Did he do well? He did. Okay. It, you know, truthfully, I don't think we've ever used this descriptor for a breakout, but it certainly holds true where the, these players will never be drafted at this ADP again. Mm -hmm. This is the the one time that you can get them at an average draft position this low, and you expect them to make the jump into um, a, a higher tier in next year's UDK where they're ranked by everybody in the same spot. So, you know, game changers, superstars uh, in the making. All right, um, Volunteers to go first on the breakout candidates for today's episode. I can jump in here why, first. Why don't fellas. you? Yeah, my breakout pick is Chicago Bears running back, starting running back, Khalil Herbert. Now, the path for Herbert has it's taken some time. He is a little bit older, but his opportunity is through the roof this year. Kyle apparently went back and kind of previewed what we were saying about Khalil Herbert before the draft actually happened. Fun fact, uh, Jason debuted the phrase Dynasty Pants. Oh, this is yeah. When Jason, oh, that was last year? Uh, no, this was this was back in 2021. This was... Oh, uh, yeah, Dynasty Pants have been around for yeah, a while. It, Jason just could not stop talking about <laughs> Dynasty Pants. Uh, and, and I mentioned, you know, on that show, Khalil Herbert was one of my favorite running backs. His production profile is great. And I apparently I said... As a, he could find himself as a three-down back if the universe works in mysterious ways, which the universe certainly does that. It continues to do that, and Khalil Herbert has an opportunity to actually be a three-down running back. David Montgomery is gone. I get it that that David Montgomery uh, is is a good enough player to keep Khalil Herbert off the off the field, but look where we are right now. Okay, through preseason. He has he played every snap. Khalil Herbert played every snap with Justin Fields in Week One. That included a third and long, which turned into a screen that went to the house. Again, I don't really care that he housed it, even though the play was great. It was more of, holy crap, it's third and long, and Khalil Herbert stayed on the field and they threw him the ball. Like that's really good news. That's very interesting. Go to the next preseason game. Justin Fields he didn't play. Neither did Khalil Herbert. And Deonta Foreman was the next person up for the for the Roshan Johnson Hive. Very excited for that running back. I understand that he looks like a skilled player who could some, make some noise, but it's not his time, not yet. It is Khalil Herbert, and right now in drafts, people going ahead of Khalil Herbert, a starting running back, on sleeper, DeAndre Swift, A.J. Dillon, 
Brian Robinson, Jamal Williams, Rashad Penny. And meanwhile, over the last decade, running backs who have averaged five yards per carry through their first two years, it is a very, very small list. But Khalil Herbert is on there. Big plays are possible. Huge rushing opportunity is possible. Chicago last year ranked first in rushing yards per game. Yeah, Justin Fields had a lot to do with that, but first in first half rush rate, first in rush rate on second and long, third in expected points per rush attempt. This was a team that could run the ball pretty well, and Khalil Herbert, I believe, is the, going to be the first man up. And in drafts, like I said, sleeper running back 38. Going in the ninth round on underdog, ESPN. He is going a bit higher on Yahoo, but still at the back of the seventh round for a player who is a starting running back for an offense that's very interesting. The the Khalil Herbert situation, and, and tell me whether you agree or disagree, but when I, when I look at the backfield in Chicago and the fact that Justin Fields is going to probably push for 1,000 yards on the ground, I kind of wonder how similar this will be to – the Baltimore running back room in respect to very limited receiving work has materialized in that in Baltimore over the years. Like I'm looking at the receive like Khalil Herbert's he caught 14 passes. Then he caught nine passes in his two seasons. Sure. You look over to Deonta Foreman. He's never caught more than nine in a season. Deonta Foreman. And then like Roshan has a little bit of that in his, in you know, in, in his profile, he caught 14 passes as a, that's but not, he was behind Bijan in yeah, Texas. That's not too bad. That's not too bad. So I'm, I'm just wondering if the the receiving work in the in the Chicago backfield is going to be akin to how Baltimore's been recently, which is you just can't find a lot of value there because it's not like Deontay Foreman's going to come in and provide that. I mean, I I'm trying to give Khalil Herbert the benefit of the doubt in my rankings, and I've given him the most receptions in that offense but we're talking about a minimal amount which look that's that stifles your upside as a fantasy running back um the, if you don't have the ability to get into the at least into the 30s in total receptions i've given him 29 yeah i i think he can i don't necessarily believe he will but i i definitely think he can get into the 30s if you look at what happened last year you have David Montgomery, who does have pass-catching background. You had a year where it was 68 targets, 54 receptions. Uh, but now with Justin Fields, last year, 34 receptions. That Sixth <laughs> lowest check-down rate for Justin Fields in the NFL. And, and so that's just something to pay attention to. He also has, like, Mooney and DJ Moore back. Sure. So. I'm not saying Khalil Herbert's going to be a oh, top, I'm not, and a I'm top not, 10 running back, but it's, like, for his ADP – I think he will break out. Look, I mean, look just at David coloring in the lines. I mean, I have sure. him ranked very high too. I'm, I'm look just... at the look what David Montgomery has done for the Bears the last two years. Running back twenty one in thirteen games. Running back twenty three in sixteen games. This and to get someone who can, I think Khalil Herbert can easily finish in the top twenty four, but he's not being drafted anywhere close to that. Very interesting stat he pulled up. Kyle did over the last decade. Running backs who averaged five plus yards per carry through the first two years, like Khalil Herbert mm -hmm. did. Um. And then how they did in their third year. Uh, Matt Burita was one of those guys. He ended up at 5.1 uh, in his third year. Alvin Kamara at 4.7. Aaron Jones at 4.6. Nick Chubb went up. Of course he did. Gus Edwards stayed around 5. Jonathan Taylor stayed around 5. So uh, two years seems to be a decent enough sample size on that yards per carry. Obviously, the amount of work you get is going to impact that a little bit. But, um, you know, Killer Herbert is going to have every opportunity that's what I like. And if he can secure it, like the competition to me, it's not, I don't care about Deontay Foreman. I don't think Deontay Foreman represents a true, like ruin your draft pick possibility for Khalil Herbert. I feel like that would be Roshan. I agree. Um, but I, we haven't seen anything yet that says, you know, he's ready to take that step, at least in the beginning of the year, second half of the year, all bets are off. Yeah. I believe the note on Roshan was, he was, uh, he's basically fourth in line right now. He will earn his way up, but as of right now, it's Khalil Herbert's job to lose. All right, quick break and back with some more breakouts. All right, I'll hop in here with a man with a Madonna-style nickname. I'm talking about Cameron. <laughs> That's it. It's I wasn't just Cameron. Sure. Wasn't sure where that was going, but it's the one name. It's the one name. It's Beyonce. It's Cameron. It's, and it's the most. <laughs> it's the most uh, I just heard Al cackling across <laughs> the studio. 
because it's the most opposite to the word Beyonce you could ever. Cameron? Cameron. Yeah. Cameron. Well, and of course, well, we have, everyone knows who I'm talking about. Yeah, but Reservation have, for Cameron? We have like Britney could be in there. Yeah. Madonna and then Madonna and Cameron. Wait, have we said of who course. you're talking about yet? Well, they yeah, already Cameron. know. Cameron. Kobe. <laughs> I mean, some people might call him Cam Akers, running okay. back for the Los Angeles Rams, but everybody knows him as Cameron. <laughs> Can't wait for him to be Just on. Just not his parents. Be on, right. on the t-shirt. <laughs> Cameron. Yeah, the, the nickname t shirt will just say so, Cameron. So, We've really stepped down so the nickname. Stupid. <laughs> Anyways, uh, to talk about Cameron so and why. Cam Akers is a breakout candidate. He certainly is. Um, you need to kind of follow his career. Mm-hmm. He it, it was like who's better, Jonathan Taylor or Cameron Akers? Uh that was that was what people were wondering. And some people were on the Cam Akers side because of pass catching. Some people were on the Jonathan Taylor side. That was the type of prospect when he was coming out. He's dealt with injuries. In fact, not just injuries, but a catastrophic, usually career-ending injury for a running back. He tore his Achilles. There are almost no running backs that have ever come back from that. Deonta Foreman did it, and he took years to get back, and now he has never been given the opportunity to actually succeed. But we saw... James Robinson hasn't been the same guy. Arian Foster's career ended shortly after his recovery. Right, and then... So you you lost basically an entire year with that, and then you thought he was done, and he got back, and he got back quicker than we expected, and then last year you had the weird thing where it was like they're infighting. I we don't know the details of maybe it was he wanted the ball more or had a bad attitude, but it was like Cam Akers was done. He was not going to be a Ram anymore. He was not even activated. He was sat out for personal reasons, like just go away. They were going to try to trade him. Remember. They couldn't trade him. They made up, and then they put him back in the lineup and said, okay, you're you're healthy. We're just going to use you. And what did he do? Because all of a sudden, he became kind of a workhorse back, and from that point forward, the last six weeks of the season, he, he dominated, man. Yes, he, was, he did. He, he, he was a running back two or better every single week. He was a top ten running back half of the time. He was the running back one one of the times. In fact, during that stretch, he was the running back four in fantasy football. I mean, he was not, you know, he wasn't just good. He was great. And he was, and one of my favorite sayings, he was drafted to be great. And this is the first opportunity he was ever given to do that after that injury. And he was. It was Christian McCaffrey, Austin Eckler, Jarek McKinnon, and then Cam Akers right there as far as the top four running backs over the last uh, six weeks of the season. Over the final month. He, on average, was carrying the ball 19 times. So these like these are not small numbers. He was carrying the ball 19 times over the final month and averaged 5.5 yards per carry, and that include, included a game against the Denver Broncos. Yeah, I mean, he's built for that kind of a workload. He's 5'10", 216. He can take that and handle it. He played on 70% of their snaps in five of those final six games. That is a number the very few running backs can it, hit. It was so weird. Yes. Though. It, it felt, was it super felt, weird. I, I'm not discounting the performance. The opportunities were amazing, but it legitimately felt like the Rams said, and we're done mm-hmm. with the season. And then it was like, let's just give it to Cam Akers every game, all game long, mm-hmm. get this season over with, get Matthew Stafford back. And then let's start anew. I completely agree. I think that's what they did. They're just like, hey, just leave him out there. Give him the ball a ton. We'll run him into the ground. We don't care about this season. But then what Cam Akers did with those carries is prove, oh, well, dang. Okay. So he's really good. Oh, yeah. We drafted you yeah, in the we second round. Dra- we right? drafted you in the second round, and you're, you're, you're dominating out here. Um, if he can get 70% of the snaps, oh, last man. year, only four running backs hit that. Dalvin Cook, Saquon Barkley, CMC, and Josh Jacobs. If you get 70% of the snaps, you're great for fantasy football. Just period. Um, and the depth chart is really begging for him to be a 70% uh, you know, workload type of guy. They've got you're, not, you're not worried about Zach Evans, Royce Freeman, Ronnie Rivers, and Kyron Williams, who mm-hmm. hasn't even seen the preseason? No. they. they I mean, it is one of the most solo type of backfields. I know that some people really like Kyron Williams. We yeah. love this tape in college. Mm-hmm. He hasn't done anything forever. He hasn't even seen the preseason football field there are a, Uh-oh. there are a handful i mean he's a starter he's <laughs> right <laughs> uh there are like three or four backfields where i feel like when they go into the running back room to like review tape they make everybody but the starter sit in the back row mm. like everybody in cincinnati there's joe mixon up front and everybody right. in the back mm-hmm. gets to sit back there this is one of the, like, austin eckler's up front 
Everybody else in Los Angeles has to sit in the back. I don't think any of these guys in Los Angeles, except for Cam Akers, gets to sit up front. Yeah, so I I believe he will receive the opportunity this year to be you know a sixty plus percent type of player. That's what I actually think will happen. But you can see the path for him getting seventy percent. If that happens, he'll be a true breakout. He'll be a league winning type of pick. He is not someone that you have to draft super highly. Um, you know, he's going right now as the running back twenty four near the the six seven turn on ESPN. That that's just. It's a shot worth taking because there's very few guys that you could say, oh, he's just a workhorse back with Stafford and Cup and Akers could actually be a good offense. I mean, we we know we've seen Todd Gurley succeed with Sean McVay's system before and be a fantasy dominator. Um, and so I, I believe, I actually believe Cameron Akers, sorry, Cameron. Thank you. Will have a very good fantasy season this year. All right. My breakout candidate was just – duking it out for a my guy spot where I ended up going Jameer Gibbs, but I'm excited to have the opportunity to talk about him on today's show. It is the wire to wire leader in the Buffalo backfield all off season. The coast to coast starter who seems to have every opportunity going into the year is James Cook. Uh, Dalvin's brother, Zamir White's teammate from college. Uh, part of that national championship team. But James Cook is going to have every opportunity to prove himself this year. And one of the surprising things about Cook is, like, if you watched him play last year when he had opportunities, to me he was always impressive. It's just that those opportunities were minimal. Um, you, you had so many opportunities that Devin Singletary took away from him, 230 of those to be exact. But when he was out there, he averaged 6.2 yards per touch. My favorite characteristic of Del – uh, I almost said Dalvin. Uh, James Dalvin. Sorry, James Dalvin. Uh, was that he just found a way to be available to Josh Allen in the passing game. The 6.2 yards per touch was the fourth highest by a rookie running back over the last decade. It was Kamara. It was David Johnson. David Johnson. Oh, you can say that because it was his rookie year. And Andre Ellington, actually. And uh, he led all running backs <laughs> – Oh, Andre. I know. He, he led all running backs in rushing yards over expectation by a wide margin last year. So, you know, I didn't think when this offseason started and they went and picked up Damian Harris and Latavius Murray that he would dominate camp the way that he he has. Um, they didn't add anybody in the draft, so that was step one. We thought maybe they'd add a younger talent in the draft. Latavius is 33, and he's going to have a role, and he may hurt uh, James Cook around the goal line as – Damian Harris might, but Damian Harris has been banged up. He's proven nothing in camp. Um, week two in the preseason, James Cook was on the field for 15 of 16 plays with Josh Allen. Um, all the short yardage snaps actually went to him. I, you know, Latavius got on the field, but not a lot. I, I just think that this is one of those players that everything that looked like it could be against him in the preseason and in training camp has been rebuffed. He's pulled the shield out and it's just deflected off the shield. And he has been the clear runaway starter for this football team. And so I still have some internal fears, but he is a seventh round draft pick right now at running back 31. And one of the reasons he was in contention for a, my guy was simply because the draft value is so it's so good. I got him at 23. Jason has him at 24. Um, well ahead of ADP with upside. And so, uh, you know, is this guy, when you look at how it can go wrong, to me it's he's between the 20s somehow, and they find a way to replace him inside the – but I just don't think it's going to happen. And I think they're going to throw the ball a lot. Sure. To yeah. James Cook. Yeah, and he's separated himself. So I think James Cook is a is a tremendous pick that you can drop right into your flex and then maybe get top 24, maybe get top 15, 16 – uh, on a bunch of weeks, he's got breakaway speed. He's got great pass-catching chops. We know how valuable those are. Um, and he really started to take snaps at the end of last year. People, this is not like a completely unproven scenario. Like, he was basically 50-50 over the back part of the year with Devin Singletary, and they obviously moved on from Singletary for a reason. So I think they have a lot of confidence in James Cook. My offseason with James Cook has been uh, the most robust uh, character arc yeah. Of, of anybody for the season because I was early on in the offseason, especially after the Damian Harris signing, it was I 
I am completely out. O-U-T on James Cook. And then the news, the drum beat started to pick up. And, was, and then he got to the point of, okay, I accept James Cook's ADP. I think it's fine. He has some upside to now to the point of, I actually have him ranked above where he's going on sleeper. And his it, the hard part is we just we have not really seen Buffalo Bills running backs sustain a season long worth of value. You've seen, you know, spurts here and there like Devin Singletary was was a good player for them. He had a couple of really good uh fantasy outputs especially last year, but it just was never ever on, on every single week and and Josh Allen just hasn't been throwing the ball to the running back that much. But James Cook, if he is truly the guy and that the talent that we saw at the end of last year on the field moved forward, he is. Yeah, I think he is someone that you should actually target. I've moved moved from out to completely in. Give me a bonus breakout pick this year. Um, you know, we all had our our main pick right there, Jason. Yeah. Why don't you go first? Uh, you want me to jump in here? <laughs> no. Um, you got it. I think that uh, this is a, a great opportunity to talk about this player. It was a my guy for the me lumberer. last year. The lumberer. The lumberer, Gabe Davis. I've been wanting to talk about him, but I feel like I'm not allowed. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I, I feel the same way about Cortland Sutton. Gabe Davis finished last year as the wide receiver 27. It was very disappointing. It came in you know, some big games and uh, some inconsistency, but he still finished as the wide receiver 27. The problem was he didn't have that true breakout that I think we were calling for. And oftentimes that happens a year late, a post-hype sleeper. It's a very common thing for people to see the path of a player to break out, call for the breakout. It doesn't happen. They fall in ADP, and then they break out. <laughs> like, that happens frequently. This is a 24-year-old wide receiver who camp reports have talked about how he's catching everything, absolutely dominating in camp, and he's being drafted as the wide receiver 43 or 47, depending on your platforms. For Josh Allen, he's the number two target for Josh Allen. Like, I get it. There were burns last year. He disappointed. But where you're drafting him, there's very little risk. He's going to beat that ADP faux show. He's not going to be the wide receiver 47. And there's a chance he actually becomes a really, really valuable fantasy asset. And at the very least, because of where you draft him, because he's your wide receiver four, he's just a vo you're injecting volatility into your lineup for big game winning performances. You better try to catch one of the four of seventeen last <laughs> year that he showed up. Last for. year, I agree. Yeah, yeah, I mean that that's you that's know that's still the risk, right? That is the risk. Yeah. That's why he's being drafted lower. But if he ends up going out and half of his games are good, that's actually really impressive for a wide receiver. And he could absolutely do it. And and genuinely, like every single day, you're reading stuff from camp about how he's just looked great. He's just catching absolutely everything. And catching everything, that's the phrase that's constantly being used. And that's the one I like the most because his catch percentage on his career has just not been very good. He caught 52% of his passes last year. You know, if he was a 63% catch rate, Last year, he would have been great. He would have been a great pick. So he gets the targets in the offense, and they're valuable targets. They're downfield, uh, in zone, you know, big fantasy scoring uh, performance. And just the final point on Gabe Davis, which is why he will dominate. This is year two after a my guy. I mean, our <laughs> history of having a year two. So you go, my wait, guy, this is a Cooper Cup call? Yeah, exactly. Man, I want that catch percentage to change because this, this guy. I know it's. I know he averages the huge yards per catch, so that's going to bring it down a little bit. But fifty-two percent of your passes, that's going to stop people throwing to you. Yeah, that's, no. got, that's got to be the transition. Yeah, I mean, he he. I there's no way he only catches fifty-two percent of the passes this year. I I really think he's in line for a much better year. And you you got to remember, he had a high ankle sprain that he was playing through as well uh, that he got early in the season last year. So uh, I I think he could still break out. He's only twenty-four years old. Jackson Smith and Jigba of yep. the Seattle Seahawks is my bonus breakout pick. He's so good. He's so good. Yeah, I mean, right now he's going wide receiver 35 in the seventh round. Um, he is – people need to remember, you, you can talk about Zay Flowers. You can talk about Quentin Johnston. You could talk about um, – Jordan Addison. Jordan Addison. This was the highest draft capital pick. This is the best wide receiver, bar none, in the draft. Players like that just end up demanding targets – and performing for fantasy. Um, 
this was a player better than Garrett Wilson and Crystal Lave by their own admission when he was at Ohio State, and you're never getting him at this price ever again the rest of your life. No, so never. If you want, if you're in a keeper league where they're, you know, one of those leagues where they're like, we get the questions every day. The draft cost is where you drafted them. And next year, you're going to be coming here going, do I keep, uh, you know, Garrett Wilson for a second or do I keep Jackson Smith and Jigba for a seventh? And we're going to answer JSN next year. Yeah. That's what's going to happen. So I think, um, you know, you don't need to be s smart enough to figure out how it happens, whether that takes away from Lockett or Metcalf or whatever. Just trust that the talent will reign supreme. And speaking of another rookie, I will talk about Zay Flowers because he is my... Yeah, I said you could talk about him. <laughs> he's my bonus breakout pick, rookie wide receiver for the Baltimore Ravens, currently going in sleeper as the wide receiver 44, ESPN the wide receiver 48, Yahoo wide receiver 51. This was the 22nd overall pick in 2023, a 4.42 40-time. He is fast. He is shifty. He plays much bigger than his size. There were a lot of... Uh, people that I trust in the draft community who were whispering the name. This kind of looks like Antonio Brown, uh, the way that he moves his body. And the bonus stat for Zay Jones is he has the lowest wide receiver one ADP with a top five QB, uh, uh, top five quarterback being drafted in the last decade. That is so, not true. It's not? No, Zay Jones it does not have that. Zay Flowers does. Zay, did I say Zay Jones? You sure did, oh, Michael. I keep I doing got it. You. you got me good. Uh, but but the point being, look at what you Boston. Think. <laughs> yeah, you got me. Uh, you got me. It's it's interesting for people to be so in on Lamar, which I am one of them. So in on what the Baltimore offense could be, the transition with Todd Monken to a, to a pass-heavier offense, to a faster-moving offense. We want up-tempo. We want passing volume. And yet, because of how ambiguous the wide receiver room is, these wide receivers are just absolutely plummeting in the draft, which I get it. I'm not sure. You're like You can't be 100% confident who to take your chance with. But I'm taking my chance on the rookie. I'm taking my chance with Zay Flowers. I think he is an absolute smash pick where he is going in the, where he is going in the ninth round. The rookies are always enticing. They're and always the, you exciting. Should. If if rookies have talent and they are in just anything that is an average to above average situation, you should be targeting them. Here here's a cool stat. Speaking of these cool rookie stat. wide receivers, <laughs> cool stat, cool stat. Uh, since 2014. There have been 18 first-round rookie wide receivers who had 50 receptions as a rookie. All 18 of them were drafted as a top 30 wide receiver the next year. 10 of the 18 were drafted as top 15 wide receivers. Like it, it, To Andy's point earlier, when, you, when you're grabbing these guys, you'll never be able to get these players again at that, at that price. Yeah, it, it is. Um, I mean, last year I put that rookie wide receiver plan into place. I was limited on my draft picks and legal record. And I added Olave and Garrett Wilson and uh, Traylon Burks, and I just kind of shot my shot. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the way. You hey, say shooters, it. shooters, shoot! And three or four of them ended up very valuable for trading for uh, giving me a shot last year. So two of the three here in the bonus breakout pick, uh, JSN and Zay Flowers. Um, cool. I mean, there there are a number of guys that I think we're all keeping our eye on late in drafts. Mm -hmm. um, that have the ability to, you know, I don't, I don't know where I sit. At, the Quentin Johnston looked good, and in, in, uh, when you talk about rookies, he looked good again in preseason yesterday. He's also had drops, uh, which was a problem for him at TCU. You know, it, when you compare that to like Jamar Chase, that wasn't really a collegiate issue for him, from what I remember. Mm -hmm. But uh, the opportunity is going to be there, and I know we like that offense. So the rookies are going to have their shot. Let's do a couple mailbag questions. You ready, Mike? Let's go. Mailbag. Mailbag. Ooh, yeah. If you have a question for the show, go to the website, thefantasyfootballers.com, or dial the voicemail hotline, 302-464-TFFB, with your question. Adrian, I'm stuck between keeping Ramondre Stevenson in round six or Alexander Madison in round 10. Ooh. Before Zeke had Stevenson, uh, or oh, before Zeke, he had Stevenson locked in, but now he's second-guessing everything because, of course. Mm. Uh, what do you think, half PPR? 
I will take uh, Stevenson. I still lean to take Stevenson because I know that he is a good player. Alexander Madison being a a really good player, that's still just a projection. Massive opportunity, but is the the round six to round ten gap well, let me tell enough. you. Let me let me give you examples just to make sure you guys stick to that right. pick. Here's what he's giving up in the sixth round in order to take that gap. He's giving up Brandon Ayuk or Mike Williams, J.K. Dobbins, T Tyler Lockett, Trevor Lawrence. Obviously, players in the tenth right. round aren't going to look like that. Players in the tenth round are going to be Sky Moore, uh, Daniel Jones, Zach Charbonnet. So, would you rather have? you know, a uh, a Sky Moore and Ramondre Stevenson, or would you rather have a Tyler Lockett and Alexander Madison? Yeah. And I lean the Tyler Lockett, Alexander Madison. I think the sixth is worth it. If if you believe that Alexander Madison is going to have a good season, I do. So I would go that direction. Yeah, I'm sticking with Stevenson. I want ceiling and a half PPR. I want receptions. I think Madison offers both of those. But again, it's Knowing that Stevenson is is an excellent player, I'm uh, I'm going to take Madison in the tenth. Jeff in Kentucky, me and the guys uh, at work are doing a super flex for the first time in 15 years of playing fantasy. I have the number two pick in the draft. Should I still take Jefferson or go with the quarterback because of super flex? Quarterback. Yeah. At number two, I would take the quarterback. Yep. Uh, Jen in Illinois is Josh Jacobs going to eventually <laughs> sign and play in 2023? Yeah, I yeah. think so. I have. I got 10 million reasons to believe he will. I have scooped him up in every best ball. When when all the news was really bad about Barkley for a week and there were the reports about how he was going to have to really consider it and he might not, you know, his his only leverage is to not show up, blah, blah, blah. He dropped a round. He dropped two rounds, and I got him in every league I was drafting in on that, at that time. I'm doing the same thing with Josh Jacobs right now, getting him in the back of the second. He'll drop to the third sometimes. Are you doing the same thing with Jonathan Taylor? So because Jonathan every, Taylor, I'm not. He's, he's – I just saw him go in the sixth round of, a, of of an actual draft because all 12 managers were terrified. Yeah, Jonathan Taylor, I, I would certainly pick him up before the sixth round. Yeah. The, 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 the risk reward, the reward there is, is worth it. But no, I'm not grabbing him the same as those other two guys because there's also the injury question mark there. Did you it's see not, the Ursa comments? Mm -mm. Where he said he, he made a bunch of comments around Jonathan Taylor again. But the one that got highlighted that, that kind of stood out was him saying, I'm really looking forward to seeing if Jonathan... Taylor can get back to being the Jonathan Taylor that he was before, like yeah. kind of like the year before last year. Yeah. So that, that's got an extra wrinkle where it's like, it's not just, if it's just contract, I, I do think Jonathan Taylor's there. I just don't know how he is because we haven't seen him. What about Josh Jacobs showing up in the worst shape of his life? Just, oh, right. Fat <laughs> Thor. It's not going to happen. <laughs> not for him. For Jacobs? No, I don't, no, I don't think so. This was Eddie either. Lazy. Um, uh, all right. Couple. Reminders, megalobowl.com. Come join us in the largest fantasy football league ever and the most fun. We've made some huge improvements this year. Really looking forward to it. Play uh, with me. Play with Jason. <laughs> beat beat, uh, uh, beat beat him in a league. In a league, that is. And then uh, we've got one other thing that we, we just haven't mentioned it a lot, but if you need a trophy, a ring, a championship belt, fantasychamps.com has you covered. And if you are one of the many, I know there's lots of you that uh, you do the draft board mm -hmm. at your draft. Fantasy Champs has fantasy footballers themed draft boards. So 12 team, 10 team, 8 team leagues. So the big board that goes on the wall, you put all the player names up there, which is it's a fun way to do a draft. They have those. And right now they're doing free two day air, which is a $25 value. So if you think it's too late to grab one for your draft, it's not fantasychamps.com all you have to do is add it to the cart the fantasy footballers draft board and they're given free two-day air so you'll have it in time for your draft worth checking out that is it for today's episode of the show what do we got tomorrow sleepers i think we got sleepers tomorrow al do we got sleepers tomorrow does anybody know what we're doing i believe in sleepers all right everyone's nodding talk to you then goodbye Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers.